God. I want to welcome all of our guests that are tuning in, literally from around the corner and from around the world. I want to welcome our guests that are here physically. It is so good to, to see everybody. I was making my way through the crowd, taking pictures, because I'm a creative. I don't know if y'all know that. I'll be posting them on the Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. Also want to give it up and say welcome to the mighty men and beautiful women of our correctional facilities in the state of South Carolina. And to the TC family, it is so, so good to see everyone. We are starting a brand new series called Gospel Friendships. Gospel Friendships. What in the world does that mean? We'll get to that point, but, but why is that important? If the last year and a half have shown us something, it has shown us this, we need each other. And in the fact that we need each other, we need each other to be at our best. So think about this from our relationship. And I know I don't know everybody by name. Some of you I do. Uh, I'm much better with faces, by the way. I got hit in the head a lot in my former life, but I'm much better with, with faces. But, but let's, let's say I don't develop spiritually, I don't develop emotionally, and, and I'm not being who God's called me to be, that's gonna affect you. And so your relationships affect other people, and so our friendships are vital. But even before the pandemic, friendship in the United States was on hard times. Some of you may be saying, why, why friendships? Because friendship matters, relationship matters. Uh, there was an old school song wrote a long time ago that says, lean on me. You just might need somebody to lean on. We all need somebody to lean on. We want that somebody to have substance to them. So, so let me give you an example of why we struggle with friendships, particularly as American and American Christians. And I know not everybody is a Christian here. If you're not, this is a safe place to be. But I need to tell you this, Jesus is not safe. And what I mean by that is this, is that he will stretch you and transform you to do things in you you never, ever thought was possible. You're like, Derwin, how do you know? If you're new here, I grew up as a compulsive stutterer. I grew up not attending church. And now look. And when I first became a Christian, I would say, no, I'm not going to be a pastor. Why would I want to do that? That's, mm-mm. God was like, you don't even know. Is he safe? Eh, yeah, a dangerous safe. He stretches us. So um, here's why we struggle. Uh, what makes us awesome as Americans is we're very individualistic and self-reliant. What makes us not good friends is we're very individualistic and self-reliant. We can get stuff done. Now, we may run over 8,000 people to get it done, but hey, we'll get it done. And God has said, no, no, there's more to that. So let me explain these, these terms. Teenagers and, and Gen Z and young adults. Individualism means this, in essence, me, myself, and I. It actually started with a philosopher by the name of Rene Descartes. He was actually a, a, a Christian believer, but because of what's called the Enlightenment in the 1600s, Europe, he was trying to get people to believe the faith, and so he came up with this, I think, therefore, I am. But when he did that, that made him and people the sinner. So even think about this. When many of us have come to faith, this is what we said. Man, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. But it's more than that, though. You get brothers and sisters. You get God's purpose. You, you, you get God's plan. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And so what individualism does is it says, no, no, I'm going to use people to accomplish what I want. And when I can't get what I want out of you anymore, I'm moving on to someone else. Self-reliance says, well, if I'm hurting, I'm not going to ask for help. Which, by the way, isn't that like not good? And, and some of us, like, we be coughing and we're sick. I don't need to go to the doctor. <clears throat> but emotionally, we do those kind of things as well. Notice in the Bible, we'll just take the Lord's Prayer. Notice it doesn't say, my Father. Why does it start with our Father? Um, the Bible 
and even in Middle Eastern countries and in Africa and, and, and mostly outside of Europe and North America, people are more communal. It's, it's us. If you're from a Polynesian background, ohana, it means we. And so when you look in the Bible, you, you see a lot of us and you see a lot of we, that we need each other. And even when the Apostle Paul uses the term you in his letters, he's using what's called a second person personal pronoun, which means he means you as a collective. We need each other. Also, Americans are friendly, but we're lonely. We're friendly, but we're lonely. Particularly young Americans are actually the loneliest, even though they're the most connected. Um, There's something beautiful about being able to be online and connect with people, but nothing takes the place of presence. Even last Sunday as we celebrated the resurrection of King Jesus. I was going through the crowd giving fist bumps and people were like crying, like give me a fist bump because there was just something about space and presence that matters. Loneliness in America has been growing for decades. Latest research says that 61% of adults in the U.S. feel it and it's only been made worse by the lockdown. You know what else happens with relationships? And this is important. If you're Gen Z, younger millennial, but for all of us, please understand this. Friends have a role and friends have a purpose, but they can never replace Jesus. Sometimes our relationships don't work out friendship-wise because we're asking people to do only what Jesus can do. Also, Friendships in America suffer because we compartmentalize our friends. We've got friends at work, we've got friends at school, um, and hardly ever do we get beneath and below the surface. But then even defining what is a friend. For the great majority of my life, I thought a friend was somebody you just have fun with all the time. So think about it, if you just have somebody that you have fun with all the time, you're probably working in a circus as a clown. No, seriously, think about it. So there has to be more, because I like to have fun. Like, like, I'm kind of intense, but I'm a goofball. I like to have fun. But that can't be the whole part of it, and, and, and fun has to have purpose. And, 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 and so what is the purpose of friendship? Uh, for those of you getting ready to go to college, you'll study this in your first philosophy class. Uh, you'll learn about Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. And one of the things they talked about was, what is a friend? And so in their worldview, a friend was about emulation, meaning who is someone that's living a life that I wanna become like? Everybody catch that? Who is someone that's living a life that I want to become like? Now, if you are high school, middle school, uh, young college, your five closest friends will tell you where you're gonna be in life. Your five closest friends will tell you where you're going and where you're gonna be in life. I heard this growing up, people my age heard this growing up. Y'all ready? Now y'all help me out, folks. Birds of a feather? Birds of a feather? If you wanna know where you're going, you look at your five closest friends because we begin to emulate them. So we're gonna talk about this. The aim of friendship, this is the first message in our series, Gospel Friends. We're gonna, we're gonna learn how to be gospel friends. A gospel friend is a person that makes you a better version of yourself. That's what a true friend is. A true friend, a gospel friend, is a person that makes you a better version of yourself. Now, let's do some definitions here. Um, Some of you guys, well, I know what gospel means. Well, what if my wife said, uh, Derwin, do you love me? And I go, well, of course I love you. We've been together 31 years, married almost 29 years. What's going to happen? I'm going to get a ah to the throat. No, you explain why. So, so, So what is gospel? Gospel means good news. It it means that there's something that's been accomplished that we want to communicate. That human beings outside of Jesus are are lifeless and doomed 
running in the wrong direction for now and eternity. Good news is Jesus came to earth and got in our way by getting on a cross in our place to give us grace, to give us a place in his family, forgiven, made righteous. We're God's forever friends. So that good news of resurrection power influences how we have friends. That's what I mean by gospel friend, some substance. So, so, so we're going to look at Romans chapter 12. For those of you new to the faith, there was this gentleman by the name of Paul, also called Saul of Tarsus. Paul, before he met Jesus, was a Pharisee. That was a subsect of Jewish religious leaders. He studied under a man by the name of Galileo. He was also a Jewish nationalist. What does that mean? It meant this. Israel first. Make Israel great again. Let's get the Romans out of here. And then this new movement of Jesus followers comes, and he's like, we're going to take them out. Like Paul would lock you up. He would ravage you. He wanted to stump out anything that did not highlight Israel's greatness, but then he met the God of Israel on the way to persecute the new people of God, that is, Christians. He met Jesus. When he met Jesus, the scales fell off his eyes, and then he could see again. So he wrote these letters called the Book of Romans to house churches all throughout Rome. Now, here's what happened in Rome, though. After Jesus rose from the dead, there were Jewish people in Jerusalem. They got the message that Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. They went back to Rome, and they began to argue and debate in the synagogues in Rome. Let me show you what happened. Look at this Jewish historian. He says these words, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christus, that's Jesus, he, the emperor, that's Claudius, expelled them from Rome. This happened in A.D. 49. Claudius said, Jews who follow the Messiah, you're out of here. Jews who don't believe Jesus is Messiah, y'all leaving my city, you disrupting peace, there's too much debating, get out. Well, in A.D. 54, when Emperor Nero came in, he said, all you Jewish people, you can come back now. So guess what happened? They came back to Rome. They went to their house churches. And guess who was leading? The Gentiles. And the Jews were like, no, 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 no. Thanks for holding it down for us, but the first team is here. The varsity is here. We're to be in charge. We're the Jews. As a matter of fact, you ever meet people like that that think they always got to be in charge? And the Gentiles are like, no, 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 no. No, um, we're actually better than you. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. At the foot of the cross, it's level. Black, white, Asian, Latino, rich, poor, male, female, we all come into God's family the same way, on our knees, hands up saying, grace, I need grace, I need mercy, I need your love, you do it in me. And at the foot of the cross, it is level, and when we walk out in the resurrection with Christ, we are a new family. Jesus' body is where sin goes down the cross, and Jesus' body is where all of his people come to live. That's not metaphorical, that's spiritual, that is a reality. Think about this. Jesus is black and white and Asian and Latino. We are the body of Christ. So racism is like hating yourself. Prejudice is like hating yourself. Don't, you, can, you can clap. You ain't got to be scared. See, that'll get the other people to clap. Latinos and black people clap. The white people will join in. They'll be like, amen, brother. And if you're new here, I joke like that all the time. Don't take yourself so serious. Like, okay. So, they're not getting along, and so Paul writes them this incredible letter, and in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, we're going to look at the art of what it means to become a friend and to be a gospel friend. But here's number one, all right? This is really important. Teenagers, be the friend that you would want to be friends with. Be the person you would want to be friends with. That's how you develop friendship. So a gospel friend is a person that makes you a better version of yourself. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. 
detest evil, cling to what is good. In the ancient world, when an actor or actress would play a different part, they would put a mask on and hold it. They were called a hypocrite. It wasn't negative. It was you're acting out a role that you're not. Jesus, his disciples said, hey, when, when, when we're not following Jesus as we should, when we forget who he is, when we give in to fear and insecurity and all the other stuff, we're being hypocrites. So love, let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. This is the base and the foundation of friendship, that when we come together as gospel friends, and this will help your marriage, this will help your singleness, this will help how you work, how you go to school, this will help everything. Number one, relationships that last have trust. On the count of three, we say trust me. One, two, three, trust. One of the greatest gifts you can give another human being is your trust. Oh my gosh, when you give someone your heart and say, I trust you with this, that is a big deal. That is a big deal because that ensues vulnerability, that means transparency, that means, here, you can, you can hold a part of me and go into the world with that. I, I trust you. When you walk out of the room, I'm gonna talk about you the same way. That my yes is my yes and my no is my no. And if I say I'm going to do it, then I'm going to do it. And if I don't, I'm going to say I'm sorry and try to make up for it. Trust matters. Do you have friends that you trust, but do you trust them in such a way that they sharpen your soul and make you more like Christ? Proverbs 27, 17 says this, teenagers, Iron sharpens iron, but one person sharpens another. I wanna give you an illustration. Zach, can you bring out my illustration? And can y'all give Zach a hand? I'll be wearing him out with illustrations, y'all. I'm like, Zach, I need some stuff, bro. Now, he went overboard this week. So I wanted to give an illustration of this is the kind of friend that you need to have, one that sharpens you, one that makes you more loving, more kind, more truthful. And so iron sharpens iron, right? So you want a friend where there's, some, where there's some sparks that fly, where you guys are sharpening each other. They're making you more thoughtful. They're making you, and I broke it. Oh, there we go, okay, I'm back. You know, we're, we're, we're like, who in your life sharpens you? Who in your life is making you more like Christ, challenging you, being with you? Who's doing that? We need these types of people in our life because this is what true, authentic friendship is. Question, who's making you sharper in your life? Who challenges like, yeah, that's wrong? I sense some of y'all going, nobody really. Well, how do we grow without the right teammates around us? So, so, so here's the thing. We live in a society of toxic positivity. It's filled with all the self-help books. You can do whatever you wanna do. Listen, don't tell your kids they can do whatever they wanna do. Tell them they can be whatever God has created them to be. That's different. One is, be whatever you wanna be. The other is, no, no, God has fastened you, God has created you, and he wants to bring this out of you, but who's the people around you sharpening? All right, thank you, Zachary, appreciate it. Gospel friendships that last, number two is, is loyalty, loyalty. Proverbs 17, seven says this, a friend is always loyal, and a brother or sister is born in time of need. If you really want to know if you got a real one, translation for those over 60, a real one is someone who is with you. They are ride or die. Translation, come hell or high water, they're in your corner. Who's your friend like that? Who, who, is, who, is, who is loyal to you that when everybody else leaves, they're there encouraging you? Now, they're not promoting your sin, though because that's toxic positivity, like, it's okay, you just had an affair, I'm with you. No, 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 no. 
No, it's like, hey, you know what? God's grace is sufficient. He will forgive you. Listen, you need to give her time. You need to give him time. You need to let God work on you. I'm gonna be here right with you. I'm gonna pray with you. I'm gonna fast with you. I'm with you all the way. I'm in your corner. I am present with you. That's what I mean by friend. That's what God means by friend. And that will deepen and satisfy our lives when we have a crew that we can roll with in that way. Back in 2004, uh, for those of you that are new to Transformation Church, my wife, uh, v- Vicky was diagnosed with papillary thyroid, or, or papillary carcinoma, which is thyroid cancer. So it was a whole ordeal. Whenever you hear cancer, time slows down. It's terrible, it's awful. So we had to go through the process and she went into surgery and friends were coming and going and I was preaching to everybody because I was so scared and I mean, it was rough. Like the love of your life, your, your, your life is getting surgery for cancer and you just don't know if you're gonna be performing a funeral. I mean, you just don't know. But anyway, this one family um, called the Skurlocks and so the husband, Michael, and I pl- actually played against each other in the NFL. And so uh, they're part of our church, but this is before Transformation Church. This is six years before Transformation Church. And they came in the morning when my wife was getting surgery and we prayed them and their young family stayed the whole time. Friends were coming and going, but they were just right there. They wasn't saying nothing, they were, they were just present. And, and the love we felt, the security we felt, it was something beautiful, like, like just the presence of them, like that is what loyalty is. Loyalty doesn't run when it gets tough, loyalty also will check you when you do things wrong. One of the things that happens in any organization, any government, any family, any church is loyalty does not mean I'm on your side. Loyalty means I'm on Jesus' side. And when you're not on his side, my job is to help you get back to his side. Sometimes people mistake loyalty for, well, even if I'm wrong, you're with me, no. Loyalty means we're loyal to Jesus first. Friendships that last, you have honesty, honesty. Proverbs 27, six says this, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Now listen, if you guys ever see me on Instagram say something like this, I believe God is calling me to teach algebra at Indianland High School. Call immediately and say, Derwin, that ain't the Lord telling you that. You know why? Because I still have cold sweat nightmares because of Algebra 1. I went to Algebra 1 my senior year in high school. My kids were doing it in seventh and eighth grade. It terrifies me. So no, I should never do that. I need you to speak honestly to me. If I come to you and I'm like, you know what, y'all? Man, I'm going on American Idol. Sunny days, everybody loves them. Tell me, baby, can you? That's a new addition for y'all young people. Just think Bruno Mars, Justin Bieber from the 80s. Okay, all right. So that... Friends are honest with each other. Now, you don't have to be blunt. Like, Europeans are very blunt. Also, my wife's side of the family, uh, um, on her dad's side, they're very blunt. He's very blunt. I don't know if it's a white people thing or just those kind of white. It it was just very interesting. So when we first started to date, I was like, man, man, these white people tell each other anything. I had to get used to it, man. Uh, Vicky's dad was grilling something and he put it on his wife's uh, plastic thing that she liked and it was so hot, it burned it and melted it and she was like, Bill, I don't like that. He goes, I didn't figure you would. I was like, wow, these white people be wilding out. I had to learn these white folks, man, it was amazing. So (laughs) I'm using humor, but here's my point. Speak the truth in love. Parents, now I know we say this all the time, right? Because I've been get, get guilty of saying this. My kids don't need friends. They got enough friends, I'm a parent. Well, that's true, 
But there's always this element of this. Never forget this. Your kids, my kids, they want to please us the most. And you know and I know and God knows they're not perfect because we're not and we were not perfect teenagers either. And so we can speak the truth in love without always going, oh, five A's and one C. Why did you get a C? And you do a, a PhD dissertation on why they got a C. And you know and I know that C's get degrees. Some of y'all acting like you don't got a report card full of C's working up at Bank of America talking about, man, I got, a, I got an eight on my ACT. I don't know how they hired me. <laughs> so what I'm talking about with friendship is there's this quality of, yeah, you know what? Let me tell you about when I was your age. I, I, I experienced that too. Because your kids don't think you experienced that. So my kids now are like 24 and 20, and now they're like, man, you guys were smart. Like, you guys got smart to know, like, you finally saw. But that's, a, but that's a part of growing up. So just remember, in your honesty, there is sensitivity, there is love, but we have to be honest or we can't really be friends. And y'all, we live in a world where truth is having a hard time. Truth is having a hard time. We live in a world where someone could literally go online and make up a lie press a button and it goes around the world. The, a, a, a lie will travel around the world twice before truth gets up and have a cup of coffee. So of all people that should be honest, it should be us. Oh man, ooh, this is gonna be a tough one right here, y'all, but I gotta obey the Holy Spirit. Hey husbands, your wife has access to your phone, right? Like your code? So like you can just grab your phone and just, Give it to her, right? Part of honesty. Ooh, it got quiet even at home on the TV screen. Okay, teenagers, the same for you as well because in today's world, you can click a button on your phone and be exposed to all types of horrific things in an instant. A part of honesty is here's my cards on the table. Man, we went from laughing to like, oh, God, move on. <laughs> Gospel friends is about presence. Man, it is about presence. Sometimes the most powerful ministry thing I can do is just be present and not say a word. Some of the most powerful things people have ever done for me is just be present Look at John chapter 15, verses 12 through 15. Here's Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he says this. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. Let me pause here. Now, I need everybody to grab me, and, and, I, and I know not everybody's a Christian yet, but for those of us who claim the name of Jesus, now notice what he says. Love one another as I have loved you. Agape one another as I have loved you. That is the strongest possible term in the Greek language for love. How did Jesus love the world? How did Jesus love his disciples? He loved them enough to grow through a heinous execution on the cross. So understand this, that when you and I say, I love you, when you say, I love another Christian, it means this, we don't let political parties divide us. We must stop selling our brothers and sisters out to elephants and donkeys because we love the lamb. You understand what I'm saying? Our siblingship in Christ is our ultimate allegiance to Christ, how we actually love each other. Love is not sentimental. Love is not an emotion. Love is a commitment to the betterment of a person which requires my sacrifice to being nailed upon a cross. That's real love. That's a love that'll change the world. That's a love that people are looking for. Typically what we think love is, is oh yeah, I love you. No, it's deeper than that, y'all. It looks like a cross. That's why our vision here is Upward, love God completely. Inward, love ourselves correctly. Outward, love our neighbors compassionately. But here's beautiful though. Here, here's something that's beautiful. God does not ask you to do it yourself. He says, I will do it through you. I can't love you like Jesus unless Jesus is loving you like Jesus through 
me. It goes on. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. Whoop, there it is. You are my friends. Think about this. Jesus says, you are my friends. You are my friends, and if you do what I command you, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I heard from my father. Jesus says, come on, you guys are on the inside. You're, we're gospel friends. This is what I've come to earth to do. I have come to reach the lost. I have come to make the orphan an adopted child. I have come to heal broken hearts. I've come to defeat dark powers. I have come to set free the captive. I have come to bring justice where there is injustice. I have done these things for the glory of God. There is a new day that's dawning, and you are a part of this day. You're friends. We're friends of God. He calls you friend. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I heard from my father. Pastor KJ and the worship team are gonna come out. And as they are singing about building our life, it's a part of the sermon. But friendship is about presence. Presence is Man, I'm honest, I'm, I'm loyal, I'm true. And if you look at all these characteristics, they're actually a living portrait of Jesus. He is truth, he is honesty, he is trustworthy, he is the embodiment and presence of God. Let the words of this song and the beautiful melodies ricochet in your souls and when I come back out, I'm gonna pray for those who are yet to discover Jesus. And then I'm gonna pray for those of us uh, to grow past our friendship wounds and to become friends.
Let's pray, family. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are trustworthy, that you are loyal, that you are honest, that you are present, that in the beauty of the cross, you took our place to give us grace. You rose from the dead to forgive us and make us family, to make us friends, so that we could become gospel friends. Uh, right now, wherever you are, God is speaking to you. Today is the day to commit your life to Jesus. Today is a day to exchange your sin for his forgiveness, your hurt for his healing, your brokenness for his wholeness. Today is your day. Uh, the Bible's very clear. It says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God in Christ Jesus is eternal life. Eternal life is not just the place we go when we die. It means that the eternal God makes us alive now and for all eternity. Today is your day. He's calling your name. Don't say you'll do it next week. Today is your day. Right where you are, if you have not committed your life to Jesus, if your allegiance is not to him, say this to him. Today, Lord Jesus, I bow my knee and I confess that you are Lord, that you are king. I confess that it should have been me on the cross, but it was you. Your blood purifies me so I can be in your presence. Your blood makes me righteous so I can be acceptable to your Father. Your blood gives me grace and mercy, and in your resurrection, I walk out of that tomb with you. I have a new life and a new power, and I say yes to you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray for the rest of us as we navigate friendships, that through the power of the gospel, we would become the friend that we would long to be that we would become the people and the person that we would like to be, be friends with. May Transformation Church be known for how we love each other well and how we love those who are yet to discover King Jesus. Heal us of our friendship hurts. Move us to apologize where we need to apologize. We pray this in your name, amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause? All right, you may be seated. Awesome. Okay, so for those of you watching by your devices, particularly a TV set at home, but also here at Transformation Church, you'll see these big old giant QR codes. Open up your phone app on your phone, point it at the QR code, and it will take you to our connection card. Now, if you pray to receive Jesus, Check on the connection card. I pray to receive Christ. I renewed my faith in Christ. If you have a prayer request, write that down as well. We have people that love to pray. But if you pray to receive Christ, we need you to let us know, and here's why. Number one, we want to celebrate with you. Number two, we want to begin to help you grow in your new friendship with Jesus. If you wrote down a prayer request, we have an army of people that want to pray for you.